Welcome to Funds and Founders. This weekly show is tailored for Austin founders navigating the early stages of their entrepreneurial journey. I'm your host and fellow Austinite, Abhinav Sinha. If you're looking for the motivation and the insight needed to build a successful company, you're in the right place. Today we have on Hugh. Hugh's been with South by Southwest, which is Austin's largest conference and convention that happens in March every year for 35 years. You're the chief programming officer and also the director of the interactive section of South by Southwest. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It is a great honor to be here. Looking forward to a uh, a wonderful conversation. I wanted to understand, and maybe this is just a personal question, but how did it start? How did South by start? What was the first couple of conferences and music festivals like? Well, South by Southwest started in 1987. It was patterned after an event in New York City called the New Music Seminar. Okay. This was an event where uh, I think Madonna was, quote, discovered. There were other big bands from the mid to late 80s that were discovered um, at this New Music Seminar event. And the idea that, well, there was a lot of Austin people that was were participating in this event also, taking their bands there getting value out of it. So the idea was that the people who created the New Music Seminar were going to come to Austin and create a New Music Seminar South or a New Music Seminar West. That seemed like a great idea. They had this experience. They had this relative business model. They kind of knew what they were doing. So that, that'll work. But of course, as uh, founders and entrepreneurs go, <laughs> all good plans uh, sometimes evaporate. And the NMS, the New Music Seminar people ended up uh, pulling out. So the team that was were the local liaisons, which were mostly from the Austin Chronicle, decided, well, why don't we just do this on our own? How yeah. hard can it be? And the upside, again, is they had they had been going to New Music Seminar. They'd seen this thing. Plus, they had relationships with all the clubs because the clubs venues advertised with the Austin Chronicle. And if you're going to do a music festival, you certainly need clubs. So they went, um, need venues, need clubs where you can do the music festival. They went uh, and, and visited with all these contacts they had. And uh, it turns out club owners are maybe more conservative than you would have thought. And they all said, you know, that sounds like a really neat idea. Why don't you come back in two or three or four years when you have a real business model yeah. and then you can use my club. Ultimately, they kept knocking on doors, kept knocking on doors, kept knocking on doors, and ultimately found roughly 20 clubs that all had the same answer, which was, well, we've got one week out of the year, which is our absolute worst week. We can't do any worse than what we're doing already that week. Take my club that week. You can have it. That week was spring break week because you had 40,000 um, students yeah. uh, leaving leaving Austin yeah. to go to the beach or go to the mountains or go wherever. And those are the, those students were the ones primarily, uh, are the ones primarily filling these clubs. So that's why South by Southwest always happens in March. Interestingly enough, within a few years, that week went from this completely dead week for clubs to, to one of the weeks that was the most profitable. And then it went, um, it grew to be, they were doing as much business in that one week as they were for the entire year. I love telling that story when I'm speaking to groups, particularly when I'm speaking to entrepreneurs, founders, startups, because I think it demonstrates and reveals two things that we we know as startups or, or that uh, that we should know as startups. One, perseverance. You got to keep knocking on doors. Yeah. You're going to get rejected a lot. Keep knocking on doors. Keep knocking on doors. Two, and perhaps even more importantly, successful startups. In some cases, the road, the path to prosperity is directly in front of you. It's obvious. Take that road. But in many, many cases, what it is, is taking something that everyone thinks is trash, has no value at all, and turning that into value. And that's what that, that's very much the, the case of, of South by Southwest with this week in March that was complete, you know, utter throwaway. I can't do anything with this. And as it happened, turned that week around completely. You know, it, it was more by accident 
whatnot that that happened in March. I, I think there ideally uh, would have happened some other time of year, probably not summer because it's yeah. too hot here in summer. But but again, that whole concept of of turning something that no one wants or no one thinks yeah. has any value into value, I think is is really reflective of the startup journey. At what point did you get affiliated with Selfify? <laughs> when did you join? How did that happen? I grew up in Austin. I went away to Ohio for college. I came back here after I graduated. I decided I wanted to start a alternative, quote unquote, newspaper in Austin. This was okay. back when print was a thing. Yeah. And I usually say it's all, it was alternative, not because of his politics or <laughs> views, but because of his publishing schedule, because it was supposed to be monthly yeah. and it was not monthly. It was probably every six weeks. But the point of that story is that I was kind of friendly rivals with the Chronicle, yeah. not really a threat to them because I was so much smaller and not of the same frequency. Yeah. Uh, so I knew these folks. The thing that I was doing, which was called the Austin Challenger, you know, we were always literally <laughs> week to week in terms of finances. I was borrowing a a lot of money from my dad to to push the yeah. thing out. And then at one point my dad said, you know, one of your biggest bills is typesetting because back 40 years ago, you had to take, if you wanted to do something print, you had to take your files to a print shop and they would typeset this thing out and then you'd paste it on and take it to the printer. And my dad said, there's this new thing called desktop publishing, which you could, it would reduce your, it would eliminate your typesetting bill. You can print your own stuff. And this was right when, you know, the first generation of laser printers were coming out that that had somewhat of the same functionality of of going to a professional typesetter. He convinced me that this was the right way to go. He bought me a computer. He was a UT prof, bought me a computer and a printer through UT because Apple was giving huge discounts to faculty yeah, folks. A, yeah. And the point of that story is that I got hired at South by Southwest because I had a computer and they didn't. Okay. <laughs> I always remember or can still remember getting the phone call about two weeks before the second South by Southwest was going to start. So early March, 1988. And Roland, who has been my boss for the last 35 years, uh, said, we're wondering if we can move our database to a computer. And I said, well, you know, computers are pretty good for databases. That's yeah. one of the things they do really well. And then there was a little bit of a pause and he said, Okay, well, how about your computer? <laughs> so, again, I got hired because I had this old laser uh, laser writer and a Mac Plus, and a Mac Plus is, you know, like about a thousandth of the computing power yeah, we have yeah. in our phones yeah. now. Certainly a lesson in having the right hardware at the right time. We spent, you know, four days straight typing all these names that were just on sheets of paper into what was then called a reflex database. Okay. Um, and it kind of worked, kind of didn't work. But from that um, trial by fire, I got pulled on as the first employee and a paid employee in 1989. And then roughly five years later, when we added, uh, in the early years of South by Southwest, it was only focused we, on music. Yeah. And then we added in film and what was then called multimedia, which seemed like a, a cutting edge term for technology. And because I had had this computer... Back in 1989, Roland said, well, you should help run this multimedia thing. <laughs> so, And that's what became interactive. Yeah. Multimedia, we held the name multimedia for about five or six years. And, and multimedia was very much focused on CD-ROMs, um, CD-ROM technology. Yes, by 1994, there were some early ver versions of the internet, but we w really were not focused on that. Again, more focused on hey, there's this, you know, you can put this disc into your computer and it has all the functionality of having, you know, 10 volumes of encyclopedias. Then as we got to the 1999, uh, you could see that the internet was going to change everything and we wanted to have the name more reflective of that and switched over to um, interactive at that point. Do you remember how many people came in that first one at, in 89, the attendees? <laughs> 89, again, that was a music event only. And yeah. we were in the probably neighborhood of, you know, 700, 800, 900 people. It was um, certainly a very new idea, quote unquote, to, 
you know, take a non-traditional industry like music and try to have a more business-like approach to it, structure to it, such that people who wanted to get into this industry or wanted to advance into this industry, take their career to the next level, would, would have, you know, two, three, four days of panels that would help them to, to do that. So in that sense, um, it was a pretty new and interesting um, idea and approach and, and certainly worked really well in Austin because there was such a strong um, music scene here. Music scene here. And, and that has certainly been the case for um, the various new elements or pivots or turns or transitions we've done with South by Southwest over the last 35 years is they always tend to reflect what is hot, what is trending, what is important um, in here in moment, Austin. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in the moment and, and particularly uh, a reflection of the personality of the city. Did everything work out in the first couple of years that you did? <laughs> well, what's the biggest fire you remember putting out? Well, the first big fire was literally a fire. I remember <laughs> that uh, after we typed all those names into computer, and I had another job at the time, and so I couldn't attend the event. And I said, well, I'll stop by in my lunch break. And this was, it was at that point hosted at the, what was then called the Sheraton, which is now the hotel called The Line. Yeah. And I remember parking my car and walking in and looking over at my computer and there was literally smoke coming out of the top <laughs> of the computer, which I don't know why exactly the smoke was coming out of the top of the computer. It was still functional for whatever reason. Yeah. Maybe uh, it just had too many names being processed or whatever. Um, but uh, that was indicative of, of uh, the kinds of challenges where, you know, you're inventing something new and... Um, an adventure, even from those early days, I think we were, by and large, giving value to our attendees, helping them create new connections, get new ideas, and uh, hence the the growth and buzz even in those very early years. What would you say was a pivotal year for South By in terms of when did you guys realize, okay, this is a lot bigger than what you like started out with, right? Is there a one or two years where you felt that you had like leaped into like a different category of event or conference? Answer a few different ways there. One, as I understand it, the first year, 1987, they thought the the organizers thought there would be 300 people come in and they had about 700 that year. Yeah. So right off the bat, wow, you know, we, we got more users than we thought. Yeah. Good problem to have. Yeah. Good problem to have. Um, the demand is there. I think... Flash forward, um, one of first big peaks and big like, wow, this, there's something here, 1994. One, that's when we added multimedia and film. Yeah. Two, it was when uh, Johnny Cash was a keynote at the music portion of the event and also played a show at Emo. So it was a you know kind of first yeah. really big name plus first kind of of many, many uh, instances where you saw someone who was an established artist, an established um, creative coming to South by Southwest to kind of reboot their career. And and for Johnny Cash, he had just released this album of, of cover versions of some of the um, more popular songs from Seattle grunge movement. And so South by Southwest was a great place to kind of rebrand himself. And there's a famous photo of him backstage at Emo's with a what was a very young 16 or 17 year old Beck at the time. But but again, this was exactly what he wanted to do yeah. was to become relevant to that audience. So 1994, big year. And then uh, when we changed over to interactive, we, we um, began to tap more into the tech.com tech boom, that buzz, really where it, I think, the, the a lot of what fueled our our more recent growth was 2004 which was when we first really pushed into social media we had um uh, a gentleman named Jonathan Abrams who is the CEO of Friendster founder and CEO of Friendster speak i had seen him on some kind of late night talk show program 
And it's like, wow, that's really interesting what he's doing. Let's see if I can figure out a way to get in touch with him. And, you know, it, it is impossible, really impossible for us to fathom in 2024. But in 2004, you know, this idea of social media, you know, really was something that you had to kind of learn and wrap your head around, whereas it, it's intuitive to us all now. It's like air, water, uh, just breathing. Yeah. You know, social media is there. But at this point, it was, you know, you're going to create this network of your friends and you're going to be able to connect with them that way and use tagging or keywords to connect with other friends. And it's going to create this whole kind of online community in a way that that you haven't seen before again that was all fresh and new in 2004 with with Jonathan Abrams then you know that led to our i would say watershed tipping point turning point moment which was 2007 when Twitter essentially launched at South by Southwest i say essentially because They'd already been out for five or six months before South by Southwest, but they were nice enough to call South by Southwest their opening um, party, opening party, launch party, um, and shows how vague that term can be. And they saw a huge spike in usership, and it, it literally, you know, after 2007, every young startup wanted to be at South by Southwest to ex to experience that same kind of spike in usership and every VC wanted to come to South by Southwest to discover the next Twitter. So that really, that 2007 event really transformed us from a primarily music event with a with a tech component to an event that was much more about tech with, with a, um, a music and film component. Do you remember how many attendees you guys had that year? I don't remember the exact number, but I do, you know, it was very different very different than where we are now simply because A, the convention center was half the size yeah. and B, the event was completely contained within that half size, the convention center. So it was certainly much easier to way manage. back when for one thing to kind of emerge as yeah. the central point. Yeah. And I say that in the context of us trying to, um, to you know, how can we recreate those kind of conditions we had for yeah. Twitter in 2022, 23, 24, 25, and have a startup just just emerge. And again, it's just so much harder uh, given the um, how much the event has scaled since then. Given that we that we have, you know, we have the convention center, but we have a half a dozen other campuses where we do content, yeah. and there there's just. Um, so many different platforms that people are on that, again, it's hard to to um, create that same kind of buzz moment. But that doesn't mean we're not still trying yeah. to do that. 100%. 100%. Yeah. couple questions. As South By has become really big, is it easier to get in touch with people and get them on as keynotes, get them to come? Like, has that gotten easier over the years or is it still a challenge to get speakers and attendees in? It is certainly become easier. You have more people return your calls. You have more people understand what you're doing as opposed to having to uh, okay. explain it. But it's still not a slam dunk. It still goes back to that, what I talked about before of perseverance, understanding that, you know, for every 10 calls you make or emails you send out or people you meet to say, big name people you meet, to, hey, can you, will you speak at South by Southwest? Maybe one or two will, will, express a real interest and maybe one of those actually works out so again i mean in in, in our startup journey in the startup journey and all things in life you can say it but it's harder to live it is you know uh remember to just keep on pushing and yeah. that that the the more uh, you push through the frustration the more rewarding the um when you finally achieve your goal the more the more rewarding that is so yes it has become easier in a lot of ways but I will also say that the the flip side of that is that the growth of the event creates some um, challenges in terms of, of people, you know, oh, no, I don't know if I want to be on that platform because I uh, because if I say something wrong, if I do something wrong, if my startup, you know, if this if it doesn't turn on correctly, like. It's the Silicon Valley skit of like being dead by the end of the day uh, where yeah. the startup is, is finished by the end of the day. So it, it is always 
somewhat of a challenge and an adventure, but it is um, being able to work with creative people from Austin, from across the U.S., from around the world is is such a, a huge kick, and I love it. How soon did South By start having a change in Austin's ecosystem? Because I think this year I was downtown, and a lot of like small shops around downtown were like, hey, we're prepping for South By because it's like our biggest week. I think I was talking to someone from Royal Blue, and he's like, yeah, we're prepping for South By <laughs> and like doing all this. And at what point did that start having a real effect on the Austin ecosystem? Was it super early on or somewhere in between? Within the first decade, easily, you you were starting to um, see the big impact on local vendors, local venues. Um, we have been doing an economic impact study for roughly the past decade, maybe longer, so quantified it that way. But even before then, yes, um, clubs were understanding that that was going to be their busiest week of the year. Uh, hotels were understanding that was going to be a, a, a big week for them. Restaurants downtown understanding that was going to going to have uh, have a, a big impact on on their business. And you know, you're beginning to see uh, again by late '90s um, some of the the clubs or downtown. Um, spaces rent themselves out to uh, various brands that are coming into town. And that certainly has only continued to grow in the 20 years since then. Yeah. I like how vivid your memory is. Like you remember certain <laughs> events in certain years, like and very exactly. And I'm assuming that's just like South by has been a very pivotal part of part of your journey for the last 30, 35 years. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, I mean, I mean, you're kind, I forget a lot more than I remember, but Certainly, some of these big events are are hard to um, hard not to remember. Um, and, and you know, I, I do think that there are some huge pivotal events within South by Southwest that kind of definitely shifted the course yep. and, and um, to where we are today. How big is the core team at South by? And the reason I ask is I think I volunteered 2016, 2017 when I was at UT, and. A bunch of folks are like, oh, yeah, we take a month off from whatever we do and we like fly down for South by and they have like some other job in some other city, but they're here for like, you know, Feb and March just to make it happen. How big is your core team versus how big does it become leading up to South by? Yeah, uh, we are at about 170 now. That is not back to where we were pre-pandemic, which is about 210, I think. Okay. That is full-time year-round folks. Okay. We typically, as you say, scale up in um, December, January, February, March with a lot of seasonals or part-timers. And then, um, as you said, and as your experience, you know, uh, there's also roughly 2,500 volunteers that are, um, that are really running the show on site. A lot of those volunteers are from Austin, a lot are from UT, but as you said, they're volunteers who fly in from um, from all over the country, all over the world, because they enjoy doing it. So, you know, roughly uh, there, there's that aspect of volunteering. Yeah. Just, you know, it's a great way to, to um, spend your March. But I also have many, many stories of volunteers who have approached it from a really strategic standpoint and made contacts through that volunteering that directly impacted where they went to for paid gigs shortly thereafter. Yeah. So again, it's a um, big picture, um, our biggest of big pictures, South by Southwest is a is a platform for new ideas and for new connections. And, and a lot of volunteers uh, use it as such as a, a way to make new connections that can lead to many new opportunities. Yeah. This is maybe lack of my understanding has the music component of South by become a much smaller portion of it as compared to all of South by with interactive film? Because I know South by started as music with heavy music. Austin's been a big music city. But in recent years, I feel like everything outside of music is a lot more bigger than the music portion of it. Or maybe that's just because I don't attend a, lo a lot of the music. So I'm unaware. But your perception is correct. Um I think back in maybe 2017, 2018, we probably hit our apex when we had 2,000 bands and 100 clubs. 
some of that was those are neat numbers, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> three digits, not two digits. We for by comparison in twenty twenty four, we're more like 75, 70, 75 clubs and uh, maybe fourteen hundred bands. Yeah. Um, so it's comparatively it's less fewer bands, but at the same time, you know, yeah. for an attendee, I don't think any attendee has seen 1,400 yeah. bands or 2,000 yeah. bands. Yeah. But along with that, I think that, you know, South by Southwest reflects these much larger trends, which is that we know that in the last 10, 15 years, every business that you can imagine has become a tech business. Yeah. So much of what is music is tech at this point. Um, and, and that's what we see at South by Southwest, that a lot of that momentum that that in the early years was going to music kind of pushed over to tech simply because that's how the landscape works. And, and certainly, you know, from an internal perspective, how do you parse these things up? How do you divide these things up? Is, is Spotify a tech company or a music company? Well, they're kind of both, right? Yeah. Um, but it, it's certainly a much different... That kind of question is much different than what we had in 1987 when it started, when, you know, people were by and large hearing things on cassettes or, yeah. or CDs or, or uh, records. I will say that in the grand scheme of things, there is a lot of consistency, even back to those early days of South by Southwest, where in, in the, at that point you had, when it was music only, you had Young bands, they were trying to get a, a record contract, trying to connect with a &R folks to get a record contract. That still happens some at South by Southwest, although it happens off of TikTok or whatever yeah. also. But what happens in 2024, it's not so much young bands trying to get a contract. It's young entrepreneurs trying to get funding yeah, from 100%. VCs, angels, uh, whatever equity folks are in town. Yeah. But it's still that buyers and sellers concept Someone with a new idea, a new approach, meeting someone who can help them get that new idea, new approach to the next level. And, and I'm leaving film out of the mix, which I shouldn't be, because so much of that happens at film as well, where you have young filmmakers coming to South by Southwest with maybe a short. Yeah. And um, someone sees it and says, wow, that's really neat. You know, how can I get involved in helping you produce something me. longer? Um, and that's happened on dozens and dozens and dozens of occasions with the film portion of the event. Coming back to sort of your role as chief programming officer, one thing I wanted to understand is when someone talks about programming for an event, what does that mean for you? What does that mean in terms of structure, schedule, lineup? How do you, what is programming for you? Well, programming for us is the conference content that we do during the day, the keynotes, the featured speakers, the panels, the presentations, all of that as well as the music festival, the film festival, the comedy festival, and whatever other kind of uh, ancillary events that are happening during the event, during South by Southwest. I technically oversee all of that. I think the most important word in that sentence is oversee. I'm not hands-on on most of that. I am generally a pretty good process person in terms of like, this is where we need to be on this date, and why aren't we there yet? We need yeah. to push harder. and trying to remind folks that, you know, the more work we can get done on this in October, the more time we have for whatever unexpected surprises come up in um, yeah. January and February. But again, we're, we're trying uh, uh, what, to your question of what does programming mean, it's trying to, to, uh, to create, enhance, further build on this platform where new ideas are shared, where, um, where, people can meet other people that can create new opportunities. And, and certainly one of the things that I think separates South by Southwest from a lot of other fantastic events around the US, around the world in Austin, is that we bring together so many different kinds of people from so many different industries. And the concept has always been that, you know, if you're a filmmaker, you can learn a ton from connecting with other filmmakers. They can help you through the dark days. They can tell you who they got financing from, how they, yeah. their process, and that's great. But you might also learn a whole lot from listening to a musician talk about how they broke through their, you know, writer's block or, or listening to an entrepreneur, how, how um, 
they got funding when they didn't think they had funding. And, and so, again, that idea of mixing these different kinds of creative people together and, and understanding that there are some commonalities, some common problems, some common triumphs that unite them. And again, do that in a city that is always celebrated and cultivated creativity in all its many forms. Do it in March and spring when the whole rebirth of a uh, whole metaphor of rebirth is happening. And it turns out to be a, a pretty neat thing. How has managing South by changed over the years, right? With influx of tech and platforms and you have new tools to help figure stuff out. We don't, I don't, I don't want to pick a particular, but let's just, let's just say 20 years ago versus now when you think about programming, putting a structure in place, how, how has it fundamentally changed and how you go about it? Well, the, the biggest change is simply the scale of what we're doing and that it was at a smaller scale before and we've continued to grow that scale. Um, You're doing two tracks versus yeah, 40 tracks. Yeah, something like that. We, again, have gotten a lot more organized yeah. and, and I'm a firm believer that that process is uh, probably more important than, you know, uh, a lot of other things. Uh, and that process is that, you know, we're, we're utilizing the full year, basically the full calendar year to, to focus on this 10-day this period in Austin in March. I, I think we've gotten a lot better at our game in a lot of ways, although the game has gotten more complicated in a lot of ways. We have a lot more competition than we ever had before. You know, certainly uh, there there's a lot more social media out there than there ever was before. And in, in the early days of South by Southwest, late 80s, early 90s, people would come to the event. They'd have a good time. They would go back to their city, their country, their region, say, hey, this thing was great. You should come to it. And that helped grow the event. F flash forward to where we are now. Word of mouth is still extremely important, but people can, you know, also watch it on YouTube or TikTok or uh, Reels or whatever people are watching on. And, and that's great in a lot of ways, but it also creates challenges that you can't hide your problems like you could, yeah. you know, before. So again, uh, the, the growth and progress of the event has has been wonderful to experience and has opened up many doors, but it's also created its own set of challenges. Yeah. And I feel like the problem, like what you're talking about with social media is people are a lot more vocal with stuff they don't like. Huh. Like very few people will go online and be like, hey, great podcast, love doing it, recorded with this person. But like if something goes wrong, you, there's this inkling to go online and just bitch about it because you can't, right? And the reason I think that's important, like counterintuitive for conferences, I was recently at a conference in Austin and the turnout was a lot lower than what they promised. As an attendee, if I paid for a ticket, they were handing out tickets, free tickets a day or two yeah. before. I would sort of be a little pissed about that. Like, hey, I paid 900 bucks for this, but now because you don't have enough footfall, you're trying to, I understand why you do that, but now I just have a negative sentiment towards them. For people who got a booth, they're spending 30, 40, 50 grand, plus flying the team out, and if they don't get even a little bit of ROI, it's just a bad experience and it becomes harder for the conference to then. And then people talk and they're like, hey, it was OK. But so now next year, whenever they want to come back, it's going to be a lot harder to sell the sponsorship, a lot harder. Yeah. To, and it becomes exponentially more visible now, because if you have one or two bad things that happen, people talk about like maybe, you know, I'm not sure if I want to do that. Right. Well, I think that back at you on that, uh, I think that. One of the blessings of starting this event, you know, uh, back in uh, before the internet was as robust as it is yeah. now, or robust as it will be tomorrow, is yeah, you could we could make a lot of mistakes in relative <laughs> darkness. Yeah. Um, certainly, there was a lot of media coverage of South by Southwest even in the early days, print media coverage, some TV, and, and if something went really want, wrong, that was going to get publicized, but not publicized in the same way, in the same intensity of, again, some of the the biggest challenges of social media where we tend to just dunk on things that are, are bad or that, you know, if someone else did get a discount and I didn't, then I'm pissed and I'm yeah. going to go on line and do a rant about that. And, and again, we had that blessing 
to to start pre-internet before any of this uh, came about, and that certainly I think was one of the many many factors in uh, the event succeeding. I like that. How involved does the Austin government need to be for South by to occur? Because if I'm correct, roughly three to four hundred thousand people travel through Austin during those 10, 12 days, if not more, maybe my numbers are off. No, I think you're, uh, I would say it's more than the 300 range. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people coming through. And so how involved are you guys with Austin facility, state, government, whatever, in carrying things out? Because a lot of things need to happen at a lot of times. Yeah. Right? At this point in our quote unquote journey, we are extremely involved. We're working with the city on planning, on where we're going to deploy police, where the barricades are going to be, um, what kind of road closures are going to happen, um, what to expect on what day. We're, we're uh, game planning with federal agencies on, you know, what what is the worst case scenario of what will happen and how we're going to deal with that. That is certainly a huge, huge change from way back in yeah. 1987 where, you know, the... the Swing it. The, the wing it factor plus, you know, we don't want to work with the city. The city doesn't understand anything about this yeah. stuff. And the city, you know, uh, didn't have any conception that this thing would particularly grow in the way it it has. But but again, um, extremely important now, just all the moving uh, pieces, all the moving parts. And, you know, we want to create a, a tremendous experience for our uh, attendees. We want to create this platform where... They can get new ideas. They can make new connections. They can create new opportunities. But most of all, we want an event that's that's safe. Um, right. And uh, with the number of people you're having in town, um, or that are coming to town for the event, inevitably that creates lots of safety challenges. Uh, hence the constant communication and constant working with the city. Do you have a number on? And you said you do economic studies. I'm just curious. I don't know if GDP is the right word, but how much like throughput does South by Southwest bring for the Austin ecosystem? Our last economic impact study was for the 2023 event, meaning the 2024 economic impact study has not yet been finalized. I think that figure was about 380 million. Okay, nice. Which was our highest total ever. That it was not necessarily because it was not because 2023 was the the biggest event in terms of attendees, more that prices had increased because of inflation. So, yeah. But that is hotel rooms bought, that is meals bought, taxis purchased, Ubers purchased, Flight, t-shirts everything. purchased, yeah. money that's going into the economy. To put that into context, that is about half to two thirds of a Super Bowl. So it nice. creates a lot of economic impact, creates a lot of jobs, um, creates a lot of opportunity. I think that you see this, uh, well, two points there. One, you see this with some of the other huge events that are in Austin at this point, i.e. ACL, the ACL Fest, as well as F1. And I remember maybe it was back in 2005, 2006, where we began, you began to hear this idea of this festival economy in Austin. That has certainly, you know, gone from yeah. idea to manifestation. Otherwise, I will say that, you know, the, that 380 million figure is is significant and impressive and again creates a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity but even beyond the 380 million that 380 million economic impact for austin of south by southwest i think even more important is the media attention that it focuses on austin it focuses on the creative culture here the innovative culture here the opportunities here all the the cool companies the cool bands the cool filmmakers and i think is very much helped create this brand Austin, which um, is more and more recognized around the U.S. and around the world. And in that sense, been one of the many factors that has contributed to the city's fairly significant growth over the last 10 years. Do you see any major changes with South by in the coming years? I know there's something going on with the ACC where they're going to start reading <laughs> of that. I don't know when that's supposed to, I'm, I've heard it's been finalized and it'll just happen at some point. I don't know when that is. Does that affect how you guys think about running South by? Absolutely. Well, uh, I think there are two questions there at least. Uh, from, the, from the Austin Convention Center standpoint, one of the big challenges we face is that 
that building will be torn down uh, end of March 2025. So we have one more year in the convention center. Yeah. Then it gets torn down and rebuilt. And it'll be great when it's rebuilt because it'll be more functional, have more meeting space, have more parking space. We'll be able to do a lot more things in the building than That's we can like now. Three, four years out. From yeah, that. but it's it's three years without a convention center, which is our... And that's if everything's on time. What? You don't think that things are going to be on time? Because Haven't you noticed that every construction project is always on time? Yeah. So, yeah, three years is the optimistic. Yeah. Um, four years is probably more realistic. Let's hope it doesn't go into beyond that. Yeah. So this will force us to reimagine the event. I think it creates lots of challenges, but certainly less challenges than... 10 or 15 years ago when we had fewer downtown hotel rooms um, or downtown hotel buildings where you can do things in. So it's going to be difficult, but it's not going to be impossible. Okay. To the bigger question of how South by Southwest changes, I mean, I don't, I don't know uh, uh, how it will change, but I do know it has to continue to change and evolve. I think that one of the reasons that South by Southwest, one of the main reasons that South by Southwest has survived for 35 plus years is that, hey, we didn't just stay a music festival. Yeah. We added new elements in, we subtracted things, we changed things, we transitioned. And that ability, that willingness to keep pivoting is one of the things that makes the event relevant. And to what I said before, in almost every instance, the changes that we've made have reflected changes in Austin. You know, we started doing a lot more transportation stuff at South by Southwest three years ago. Well, why was that? Well, one, you could see that your car is your biggest uh, piece of hardware and that these industries are, are merging. But yeah. even more so, I mean, look, Elon moved to Austin. You got this yeah. huge Tesla plant. You've got this long tail of, of transportation um, industries that were never here before. Same thing. Roughly 10 years ago, we, we started doing more health and med tech content. And one, again, you could see that that tech was inevitably pushing into this industry and trying to, uh, you know, reinvent the industry. But two, you had the Stell Medical School that was being built here and was going to change the, the city of Austin's complexion. So when people say to me or ask me, you know, what is South by Southwest going to look like in 2030? And I usually say my kind of smart aleck response is, I don't know, but I think it will look a lot like Austin. Yeah. So. I like that. You know, I, I, I think that I would guess one of the early bets there of where we push more into the, the coming years and by coming years, I mean 2025 at least is, you know, doing more quantum stuff. Certainly yeah. UT seems like they're making a, University of Texas seems like they're making a huge effort to become one of the epicenters of, of quantum research, of quantum deployment. We also see that with uh, one of the city's more uh, prominent um, founders, entrepreneurs, uh, Worley, what he's doing with, with quantum. So, you know, that, that is certainly one of my guesses or bets that come back in two or three years and quantum will have gone from 10 sessions in 2024 to maybe its own track in 2027 or 2028. But I, I think there are other things also. I mean, maybe uh, Austin becomes the uh, capital of sneaker culture or something. I don't think that's <laughs> yeah. realistic, but if so, you, we'll do more sneaker stuff. Yeah, makes sense. I like yeah. that. I like that approach because South by is geared towards the Austin ecosystem. And I don't know what the breakout is. Like if 300,000 pe 300, people are coming how many are Austinites versus how many are outside of Austin? Do do you know a breakup with that? I, uh, I'd say uh, probably a third Austin, two thirds okay. from outside. Yeah. But but yes to what you said. I mean, uh, South by Southwest, the creativity, the innovation, the forward thinking that we celebrate and try to propagate at South by Southwest is very much a reflection of the creativity, the innovation, the forward thinking in Austin, for whatever reason, um, and I would say that if you have to name one reason, it's the University of Texas. Yeah. There is something in the in the DNA of this city, in the water of the city, in the mindset and personality of the city that that breeds a lot of pretty interesting entrepreneurs. You can see that in Whole Foods. You can see that in Alamo Draft House. You can see that in Yeti. Um, 
all this CPG stuff that's happening in the city now, but also, you know, the, the, the various um, uh, strong and significant AI startups we have in the city, the, the quantum stuff that's beginning to emerge. Again, this city has always been a place where new ideas are welcome. People with new ideas are uh, not shunned as much as they are maybe other places. And that's um, that kind of create, creative approach, creative spirit, creative mindset is very much uh, what we embrace and what we uh, what we live for and from at South by Southwest. I like that. I, I think on your point about UT and quantum, I think UT is geared to um, already prepared because they have a really big pickle center. They already have resources in place. And so it's it's a natural spot to like grow from. And it won't be, you don't have to set up from scratch. So um, I went to the Texas Venture Gala recently and heard a lot of folks are also talking about quantum encryption, quantum this, quantum that. I'm like, okay, I've been hearing this a lot more even after you're saying it than I did last year or any year before. Yeah. So there is definitely people building in that space and UT seems like a good place to start. Yeah. Th- that said... You know, witness my stock portfolio. The future is incredibly difficult to 100%. to predict. Um, sometimes it goes as we think it goes. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think one of the the bigger challenges of the quantum coming quantum revolution or quantum hype cycle or whatever you want to say, as compared to our current. AI revolution, AI hype cycle is AI. We can kind of understand it, uh, if for no other reason, uh, because so much science fiction about it. Yeah, grew up yeah. with this stuff, and okay, so suddenly you have a HAL type computer, or you can see that that is is possible. Yeah. Quantum is big picture, easy to understand. It's going to make things a hell of a lot faster. <laughs> Smaller picture, uh, it is perhaps more difficult to understand. And I've always thought that that was one of the um, the big challenges of crypto is that if it's hard to explain a technology to your, to your neighbor, to someone who's not a tech person, and I'm not really a tech person, then I think that really limits its ability to go, uh, to go mainstream. But, you know, to the, again, uh, AI is different than that, and as I talked about before, social media was something that maybe it took your head a little while to wrap around it, but once you got it, like, oh, for sure, that's cool, right? So human understanding is a a big part of human adoption. 100%. Going back to programming for Southwest, uh, South by Southwest, how, how many years in the future are you guys working and planning? Are you, like, 2025 and then the day it ends, you start 2026? Or how how far ahead do you guys plan and, you know, start figuring stuff out? Well, I'm, I am absolutely flattered that you think we're that organized <laughs> that we're doing 2029 now. Um, no, we're very much just spending 11 months focusing on the next year. There are some occasions where, you know, we'll reach out to someone and they'll say, well, it just doesn't work for me in March 2025, but I'd probably like to do it in 2026. So we put that on a list or database somewhere of people to, to return to, but very much one year at a time. I, I do think from a process standpoint, and I said earlier that I think I'm pretty good at process. Yep. It would be great if we can move to more of a model where we're, we're doing a two or three year planning cycle. Planning cycle yeah. Uh, but we're not there uh, yet. Um, I think one of the, the, challenges or opportunities of this lack of convention center for three years is that it, it is forcing us to start thinking about that 2026, 27, 28 timeframe yeah. now when normally we wouldn't be thinking about that until, you know, April 2025. Yeah. Going back to hosting a good event, right? Like, let's take South by out of the picture. Just want to get your opinion on what do you think is a good event and a good conference? What should someone trying to host one, like what outcome should they work towards? Because just getting people there, I think, is just 10% of the battle. But what's a good event to you? What's a good event, good conference for you? Let me first start by saying you said take South by Southwest out of the picture, and I'll, I'll build on that. I, you know, 
we have been fortunate enough, lucky enough, um, gotten a lot of uh, uh, correct bounces to to grow to the scale that we are now, and and that means that I get to go on um, podcasts like this one, and and that is a kick and a lot of fun. Having said all that, there is nothing particularly magical about huge events like South by Southwest. In many ways, in, in many, 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 many ways, smaller events are uh, much more valuable from an attendee perspective. And, and so much of what we do at South by Southwest at this point, ironically, is trying to break this large event down into much smaller things. So to your question, what makes a good event? I think it's the ability to create a platform where people can learn new things is important. But even more so is creating a platform where people can meet other new people um, that can inspire them, that can invest in them, that can connect them with other other people. And I think that, you know, in the, in the vernacular of a tech event and a lot of the people who are from the tech industry, myself included, you know, I'm pretty introverted so how do you create an event that introverts feel comfortable at yeah um people who don't know how to or aren't comfortable walking into a room and going up and shaking everyone's hand and introducing yeah. themselves so trying to create those kinds of platforms those kinds of opportunities i think that what we've done you know within south by southwest a lot more of in the last 10 years is just create a lot more meetups during the event. That was something that for a long while I thought, well, why, why should we do meetups? I mean, people can meet each other. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. I don't they have that. But, you know, there is something to to creating a formal structure there where if I'm, you know, a podcaster and, and I want to connect with other podcasters or if, I, if I'm interested in getting into the podcast space and I want to learn from other podcasters, that I know I can go to, you know, room 105 at... Um, 10 o'clock in the morning and there'll be a bunch of podcasts. Yeah. 30, 40 other people there. And it's a target rich environment where I can learn a whole lot. And, and if, if, you know, if you can put together enough things like that, where, where people come out of the event with business cards or virtual connections, opportunities for follow up that lead to um, career advancement, lead to funding, lead to someone else who leads to funding, then then that is, I think, what is a, a successful event. I will also say that in 2024, the world we live in, um, and somewhat uh, because of the social media stuff that we created, I think that it's important to create events that inspire people, where people are coming out of the event with a, a sense of hope that, that things are, are going to get better. Um, and uh, because I heard what so-and-so said and, and they, they have this vision for the future that's a lot better than these other visions that I'm hearing and uh, it's all going to be all right. So there. I 100% agree. I think one thing that really matters for a good event and to your earlier point about introverts, um, have you heard of Nick Gray? He's uh, an author in Austin. Yeah. He's written a two-hour cocktail party. He does this thing at events where he's super energetic, like welcoming. If he sees someone standing alone, he'll bring them into the circle, introduce them, and then just walk off and like go to a different circle and try to like foster connection. And to your point, I think a lot of folks just don't know how to start a conversation, are afraid of like saying hi to someone who maybe doesn't want to talk to them. And being able to foster those sort of like relationships or settings where someone feels more comfortable. There's a little less apprehension and you're willing to go talk to someone because there's something I know we, I can yeah. talk about podcasting, right? Well, two thoughts there. One, yeah, that takes a special talent or or the people who do that and, and will bring people into the, yeah. the conversation. They are, uh, we need more people like that in the world. Two, you know, I think one of the things that we pride ourselves on at South by Southwest, but probably not that unique to South by Southwest, is the kind of serendipitous connections that um, happen. Uh, you know, I was in, in line for a taxi, and that's where I met the VC who funded my <laughs> startup. I know from experiencing other events, the serendipitous connections that 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 happen for often happen for me, who are, I'm still fairly introverted, is you know. 
I'll go to uh, <laughs> the uh, cafeteria or something and there's um, nowhere to sit. So I'll have to sit down at a table or I'll sit down at a table yeah. with other folks. And then we end up becoming, um, you know, that was kind of forced connection, yeah. but we end up becoming friends and I'll see them later in the day. And, and that kind of works. And, and, you know, strangely, there have been some phenomenal connections that I've made at, at South by Southwest and other events that way where someone were just really, we just sat next to each other and then started talking. And then, you know, five years later, I'm looking for a speaker from Vancouver. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I met that person in Vancouver. I'll connect with them and maybe yeah. they have some ideas. So I, I say about South by Southwest, but I think it's true at all events. And, and really back to your question of what makes a successful event is small connections can lead to big things. You know, it's great if you can make a connection to someone from Andreessen Horowitz and they write you a check, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, 30 minutes later. I don't think that happens too much in real life, but you meet someone who knows someone else, who knows someone else at Andreessen Horowitz. And, and those are the kinds of connections and kind of, uh, things that, that lead to big opportunities at places like South by Southwest and, and so many other great events. I feel like everyone's fundamentally one or two connections away from the person you want to meet, right? And it's just a matter of you got to put yourself out there and talk to folks yeah. because you don't know who knows Andrews and Horowitz, right? Like, and just random connection here and there, but you got to put yourself out there, manifest what you want, ask for what you want, and someone will know someone and eventually you do get in touch, right? And Absolutely. but And I also think that one of the weird ironies of this, particularly within the tech world, is I mean, we have so many tools at this point for connecting in a virtual space, um, whether that's social media, LinkedIn, you know, um, immersive experiences, yada, yada, yada. But what we always rediscover at, South by Southwest and other compelling events is that I will accept you as a friend on LinkedIn, but that is a fundamentally different process than I meet you sitting next to me at South by Southwest and we strike up a good conversation about why is it raining outside yeah. and we decide to go have lunch and then that evolves into something completely different. So it's that face-to-face -face technology in a very technical world yeah. that is ultimately so, so important. Yeah. I think Sam Altman said on some podcasts this last week that over the next five, 10 years, in-person events and interactions are going to become a lot more important in the next five, 10 years, just because of how automated and like mundane, like tech is becoming, right? Yeah. I and mean, you could literally sit in your house all alone and like run a billion dollar company, but in-person events are going to be more important. Well, there, there's... A, that sense of authenticity and, and uh, that you get from an in-person event and particularly meeting someone, human connection is still very, very, very important. I think that it's conceivable that five generations from now of Oculus or Apple Vision Pro, like, you know, the haptics will be perfect and the 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 you won't be dizzy and I'll feel like I'm... Two right. feet away from you, but we're we're clearly not there yet, yeah. uh, and, and maybe we'll never get there, and that's probably a good thing. I mean, if we ever get to a point where we can just stay in our house all day, where we have lost something as a human race, right? Or lost a ton as a human race. Two quick questions: What do you scope out other events, and do you go to other events to see what people are doing, see what you can do better, or do you not have time for doing that? That is a great question. I do tend to go to a lot of other events and uh, I'm not good at other events because I always like, gosh, they do this a lot better than we do. Oh, God, they're so much better. Why aren't we doing this right? And, uh, so it, it, it inevitably kind of creates these um, uh, moments of lack of confidence. But yeah, I, I, I uh, have certainly made some great connections at other events, seen great speakers, scouted out great speakers, and so it's a, a big part of what we do, what I do and what my team does. Nice. Is there one thing from the 2024 South by that you want to do better next year or change? There's always things that we want to do better. And it's never, you know, it's, it's this ever evolving beast. 
we talked to before we started recording about your idea on long term. And I yeah. think we've always taken that approach at South by Southwest that we're going to, you know, have a long term approach on this. We're going to correct a couple things every year and gradually we'll have fewer things to correct. That said, you know, uh, we still have a long way to go in terms of correcting things. I've, uh, if, if we ever got an event where I was like, wow, we did this, we nailed this completely, I would, you know, mic drop and yeah. walk off stage yeah. and move on to the next thing. But in terms of specific things that we did at South by Southwest this year, I mean, on the positive side, I think that the content we had for International Women's Day on March 8th was fantastic. We'll have that opportunity again next year. March 8th will be on a Saturday. I think we can do more compelling content on um, a lot of the uh, up and coming technologies and also have to, you know, reassess very strategically, you know, how much do we push into AI because everyone's talking about AI or how much do we pull back a little from AI because everyone's talking about AI. Um, and I think there are certainly lots of opportunities there, but it's also um, uh, we don't ever want one technology to or one thing to dominate the event. And I think we're a little bit of risk of that in 2024. Just throwing it out there, not that you asked, but um, one thing that I haven't seen done really well with the whole AI thing is everyone's talking about the tech, the new LLM, this, that. I feel like I haven't seen enough of, okay, AI has been technically like popular for the last year and a half, two years. How has it fundamentally changed my business, the way I run it? How has it changed this industry, the way we do this? I don't think there's enough of that that I've seen. And by that, you mean kind of like uh, case studies, use like, cases? Like, like yeah. actual implementation impact. Yeah. Like, hey, we took out these three roles and now we use an LLM and we know we save 300K a year and we're making six, like whatever, right? Yeah. Like, but actual hard evidence and feedback of like, this came out a year ago, we actually implemented it, it took us six months and here's the impact and this actually works, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of tech that looks good, but when you start using it, it's like, it's not really to the level where I can actually switch out my whole team and use an LLM. Yeah. And I think like seeing more of that would help people understand, okay, how do I use this? How does it actually fit into what I'm doing? Agreed, um, but I'll, I'll say back to you, I mean, that is totally reflective of the hype cycle that we're in now. 100%, 100%. That, that, that uh, with any new technology, you, oh my gosh, this is going to cure everything and yeah. uh, make the world a better place, slice bread, cure cancer. And then you kind of realize uh, a little bit farther into the, the um, uh, implementation that, well, it does a lot of really neat things, but are there, 100%. what are the business models there? Yeah. And, and that's, I think, what we're seeing a lot of with um, AI now. I mean, certainly the, the what I'm probably most attuned to is just hearing, you know, content creators of many types say, well, I was writing this last night and I wasn't particularly satisfied, so I put it into, uh, you know, my favorite LLM. LLM and it came back with 10 different ideas, nine of which I thought were bad, but one was really good and then I reformed that. So, so that, that's neat. That's yeah. something. But yeah. again, is that really saving 300k a year well maybe if you're if you're a business that had 10 copywriters yeah. you can maybe just reduce that by one yeah. but yeah 100 percent agree sweet i like i like ending every episode with quick couple rapid fire questions what are three resources that you'd recommend to someone listening it could be book podcasts anything just three resources that you like uh, podcasts. I'm a big fan of, um, pivot. So I listen to that pivot. a lot. Uh, and certainly Karen Scott have been big parts of South by Southwest. So there's that reading. I, I'm always, um, excited when in, in the uh, relative down period of April through July, uh, when we're not quite as busy as the other times of year and I can read a lot more and just, just always kind of amazed yeah. at, wow, look at all the good ideas. And then third, um, if, if you're seeing where we're taping, I've got my Mead notebook here and I find that the more things I, the physical act of writing things down yeah. helps my creativity and it can, and you know, it's that whole thing of 
well, I'll write down 50 ideas, maybe 49 of them are trash, but there's one that in there that, that can be morphed and pivoted. And again, I can do it in my mind, but there's something very different about writing it down. Um, and I've been much more aggressive about that in the last probably six months nice. to where I'm going through one of these notebooks every, every month, nice. every three weeks or something. Nice. Uh, but again, um, that, that works really well for me. I like that. What's been your support system? You've been at South by for 35 years. What's been your support system throughout? What keeps you going? How do you stay on top of things? I mean, I have a lot of friends. I've got a wife that supports me, uh, everything I do. And, um, I uh, have an incredible staff. I don't think I ever intended to stay this long at South by Southwest, but again, I uh, am very, uh, we've never quite gotten it to be quite the event I think it can be. And until we get there, I'll probably keep going a little bit uh, longer. And I, I will also say, I mean, less support system and more just dopamine, um, which tends to fuel a lot of our, uh, our our habits in life is that, you know, every year I'll have 5, 10, 15 people come up to me during the event and say, this is the highlight of my year. I I, um, I came here last year. My startup got funded. I found a co-founder. Or I, I secured a co-founder. I got a new job out of it. I met my boyfriend, my girlfriend. It, it just inspired me. And, you know, Hearing that from people and and thinking that you had some small impact in their life that's that's really neat. 100%. That's that's keeps me going yeah. <laughs> a lot I, of the time. I think people ask me why do I do this podcast, and my response is, outside of the conversations and relationship building, is if even just one person listens and can get something of value out of it, I feel like that's enough reason to do this. Ideally, yeah, more than one person, but even if just one person yeah. does that, well, uh, very much agreed. And and you know we're. And so many things in in our lives at this point in 2024 and beyond, where we think about scale. But you know, again, it's these small connections, even at one person, yeah. that uh, are really valuable and meaningful. And that's a lot of what keeps me going. Yeah, I do this segment where I ask everyone a last question from a previous guest, and then I'll ask you to give me one <laughs> for a future guest. So your question, not not super deep. What's a show that other people get into that you're not that into? What's a show that other people get into? We're talking TV yeah, or something yeah. else? Could be anything. But yeah, the the person who asked it asked about TV. Well, in the current vernacular, my wife and my son and a lot of people I know have watched Three Body Problem, which okay. uh, premiered at South by Southwest. I have not yet touched that. I am tend to be not great on episodic simply because I know that I'm addictive and if I start I will never you binge stop everything yeah. yeah I will binge everything and I don't quite have the time to that to do that so I'm not that that is you know there, there's three body problem is just a a uh, tip of the iceberg there I, I never I mean I kind of read and lived the whole succession stuff. I never really yeah. uh, participated in that. Same thing with Game of Thrones. Yeah. Uh, I think I watched it for maybe half a year, but it was just like, I, I can't yeah. completely immerse myself. When you say this. that, because the guest who asked me this, her response was Game of Thrones. It's, huh. She doesn't get it. Like people huh. do it and she's like, I don't get it. But interesting. What what would be your last call? What would be your question for a future guest? Okay, my question for the future guest, uh, maybe more difficult, maybe not, yeah. is... What do you think Austin looks like in 2030? What are the um, industries that are booming here and the industries that have receded? What are the biggest problems that we'll face at that point? Sweet. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming on. Where can listeners find you? What do you want to plug? What should we link huh. for you in the description? I certainly find the most South by Southwest information at sxsw.com. Uh, via the socials, I have really retreated to... LinkedIn. Um, don't do a whole lot of Twitter or X anymore or, or various other things. Um, and I'm always open to emailing me. I'm hugh at sxsw.com and love to hear from people with uh, suggestions, uh, brainstorms, constructive criticism about South by Southwest. We're a community event and lots of times the community understands what's compelling much better than I understand what's compelling. Sweet. And we'll link everything in the description, but Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate the time and 
I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful conversation and uh, look forward to listening to more of the show in the yeah. future. Thanks. Thanks for tuning into Funds and Founders. If you're a local Austin founder, a venture capitalist, or just someone who's building and in the middle of their journey and would like to be featured on an upcoming episode, submit your guest pitch to abhinavsinha.podcast at gmail.com. If you have a founder-specific event you'd like to promote on the podcast, you can also reach out to me. If you want to continue to get support through your founder journey, hit the follow button and I'll see you in the next episode.